Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the nest. This is Jim Chu from San Francisco, California, and today we have three inspiring entrepreneurs from Kenya and Bangladesh. We also have three business angels from the United States and also from Kenya. So let's introduce ourselves. My name once again is Jim Chu. I am an entrepreneur and investor based here in California. I started The Nest during the coronavirus lockdown because I wanted to connect more inspiring entrepreneurs from developing markets with investors from around the world. So here we are. Over to you, Steve. Thanks. So my name is Seusif Tawia. I'm a angel investor out of Ghana. Uh, I've got you know, about 20, exper 20 years experience in financial services across Europe and Africa. And essentially, angel investing is my full-time job now, uh, plus a bit of consulting and advisory to different organizations these days. So hello from Ghana, where we are kind of uh, progressively uh, uh, deconfining. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And it's glad to see, I'm glad to see an entrepreneur from Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm sorry, an investor from Sub-Saharan Africa on the nest as well. Wonderful. And Jim, could you introduce yourself briefly as well? Sure. Um, thanks for having me, uh, Jim. Uh, Jim Davidson from Denver, Colorado. i am uh, been an impact investor for about 10 years now, including as a general partner in Dev Equity. We make investments in Central America, agricultural supply chain, real estate, urban redevelopment. And I'm also um, a co-chair of Central uh, Social Venture Circle, which includes Investor Circle, the original Impact Investing Angel Group. And through that and other connections, I made several angel investments, including uh, Prava Health in Bangladesh and um, Copia Global and Jibu Water in, in Nairobi. So I have a little bit of experience overseas, but happy to, to take part. Wonderful. Well, great. So let's get going with um, the presentations from the participants, from the entrepreneurs. To do that, I'd like to do a quick introduction of each of them. We have Jason Eisen from Utu, Benson Mugisha from RightSafe, and Sebastian Grove from SoulShare. I'll let them introduce themselves and their companies. But uh, I'd like to first hand it over to Jason for your presentation. I'm gonna stop my sharing and then if you can share your screen and be ready with your presentation, it'd be great. And just as a quick note for everybody, the format is we will have five minutes to present and then uh, we'll have another 10 minutes of question and answers from the panel. And if there's time from others in the audience and then uh, for um, any uh, discussion and potentially uh, any deals. All right, Jason, hand it over to you. Thanks very much. Let me get my screen share up. And by the way, I, I love your photo. You look, you look like you're in LA. Uh, I was taken on a random street in Tel Aviv. I think I was enjoying my, the sun too much and someone came up and snapped that. All right. Now let's start the video so you can see my pretty face. Here I am. Hi, everybody. And this is Utu. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Yep. Awesome. So let's go to presentation mode. Well, actually, like this is probably OK. So uh, yeah, I have a pretty simple question for you guys. Who do you trust? Uh, this is the question I've asked all over the world to a couple thousand people at this point, and everybody tends to answer this question the same way. They say, I trust myself, I trust my family, and I trust my friends. Okay, well, some of my friends for some things, sometimes. And turns out everybody in the world pretty much trusts like this. Uh, you guys probably sitting at home nodding your heads, thinking, yeah, it's pretty much how I trust. And actually, Eric Schmidt said it best that in a network world, trust is the most important currency. And this is exactly what we do at Utu. We're trying to bridge the gap between how people trust in the real world and how they're asked to trust online. Uh, 
So let's take an example. Imagine you go to the babysitter app. You need a babysitter and you find one babysitter there that has 50 five-star ratings from 50 random people that you've never met, that you have nothing in common with. By the way, you don't even know if they're real people, but they could be bots or paid reviews. But according to those five people, those 55 star ratings, this nanny is great. You should leave your five star, your five year old with her or him. Now the question is, you come to that same platform and that same nanny has 55 star ratings and one one star rating from your sister. What do you do? Do you follow the 50 or do you follow your sister? Most people say they follow their sister. So what if that number is maybe 500 good ratings and one bad one from your sister? What do you do? Most people still say they follow their sister. So the question we ultimately ask is if one recommendation or one validation from the right person about the right feature at the right place at the right time is more valuable than any number of aggregated, anonymous, and um, averaged validations and data points, why is every platform on the internet bending over backwards to show us these overwhelming numbers of random anonymous or pseudonymous validations when this one is better? And that's actually what we as Utu do, again, trying to bridge that gap between how people trust in the real world and how they're asked to trust online. And we do this as a sector agnostic trust infrastructure as a service that we offer as an API across the internet. And this is essentially a business model change as much as it's a theory of trust change from the existing solutions around trust out th that are out there. Things like Yelp and TripAdvisor, these are trust companies, but they're products, they're consumer facing. But trust is not a product, it's an infrastructure. It should be baked in as infrastructure to the platforms that we're going to to get the services that we already need. And this is a, also what opens these platforms up to large scale manipulation and fraud that I can go and create an account. I could also go and create a thousand accounts. Uh, so by moving this to an infrastructure service, we eliminate that systemic fraud and we actually deliver trust as it's meant to be as an infrastructure. The same way nobody builds their own mapping or payments or CRM anymore. They just integrate the APIs for Google Maps and Salesforce and whatever other service. Uh, the trust mechanisms of platforms and the internet are the last things left to be provided as infrastructure. Uh, just so you can see a bit of how this might look and what we mean when we talk about a new form of digital trust. Uh, essentially, it's socially powered based on you and, our, and your relationships owned by you and controlled by you. Everything given in human descriptive language, not scores or uh, numbers like confidence intervals that are pretty meaningless. So we deliver this as a freemium API pay based on consumption and it's available to small companies as well as big marketplaces, global marketplaces. Um, the team is probably the thing I'd like to spend a good bit of time on. Our CTO uh, did his PhD at the intersection of privacy mechanisms, distributed systems and AI for trust. Our head of data science, Alex Mwai, is a nuclear physicist, uh, did work on the particle accelerator data, large data sets. Our COO and head of mobility is probably the most experienced mobility person in the, in the continent, uh, having worked for Easy Taxi and Little Cabs before joining our subsidiary mobility company. It's actually how we started as, as a mobility business, the first taxi app in Africa, way back in 2013. We realized there was a need for better trust and we built this trust solution to solve the taxi apps problem. We've ended up scaling that taxi app business uh, around the continent through a franchising model. Uh, it's continuing to grow, also serves as a primarily a user catchment and a go-to-market channel for our trust business. Uh, we've come quite far, doing about 30,000 MRR, and we've got about 170K MRR that we're looking to finalize. Unit economics are strong on the mobility business, and we're actually getting starting to get some great revenue on the trust side of the business as well, with one of our early clients uh, agreeing to pay us a full year subscription up front. That's about uh, 50K. That's a lending sector marketplace. So I think I can stop there and happy to take your questions. Great. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. Well, love to hear from uh, some of the angel panelists. Who would like to go first, Jim? 
I, yeah, this is Jim. Th thanks for that. I, I think I understand what you're trying to do here. And um, it, it strikes me sort of these apps based on social connections and whatnot suffer from what I call the, the empty disco floor. You know, how do you know, how do you get enough critical mass when there's enough people on there? Uh, and I know you, you started with the taxi app and you can imagine like in that domain, but how do you see getting to enough folks on the platform, especially in these clusters of trusted communities? What's the, what's the means by which you can bootstrap that so that it becomes trusted? Sure. So there's a couple answers to this. One is that we're actually way better connected than we think we are. Uh, so by the time we reached only about maybe 25,000 users in Nairobi in that mobility business, we had several hundred thousand relationships that had been mapped across those 25,000 users. And so uh, oftentimes we're better connected than we realize. And there are people in our network that can recommend us things. We just don't know it. So that's one part of it. Uh, part of that uh, is to focus on local level marketplaces, city level marketplaces before going to larger geographic scope marketplaces because the density of connections are greater and the smaller the scope of the marketplace and you can build a lot of those together. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we've taken the mobility business to market as a franchise business outside of our flagship here in Kenya in Nairobi because it's a highly scalable model that basically moves the scaling of a mobility business from a cost center to a revenue center. So lots of entrepreneurs can, we can decentralize the go-to-market across the entire continent, enter smaller markets uh, without the hard ROI calculation that comes from a centralized expansion. And that's just in the mobility. Mobility, if you think, is kind of the low-hanging fruit of the sharing economy. Before you use most other sharing economy apps, you're probably going to use a mobility app. So in terms of thinking a wide net that captures uh, most tech-enabled folks, uh, certainly tech-enabled uh, folks across the continent, but even beyond, uh, mobility is ideal. And then beyond that, we have flagship partners and pilots in other countries and other continents that we're working on, anchor clients that help us establish in those places. We don't try to build those end marketplaces in every sector. Uh, otherwise, outside of the mobility sector, we're really a B2B infrastructure as a service. Okay. Okay. Steve? Can, I, can I come in, uh, Jim? Yeah, I've got a cool question for you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes, I can. Good, good. So I, I'm, I'm going to be a bit controversial here. I, I'm the type of guy, I need to see somebody eye to eye and meet him a number of times. We hang out together, we get beers together, we get coffees together, etc. before I can build trust, right? So I, I'm trying to understand if you can quickly give us a, a use case whereby you know the utu's infrastructure can be can be can be used and i'm i'm coming from a point where i was the early users of linkedin and the premise back then of linkedin was we are all about seven you know distances from each other globally and i would recommend somebody to you who is in my network initially because i know the person i trust them and then these are the competency i can vouch for so this is where I'm coming from. So if you can help me understand that, that sure. would be very good. Yeah, actually, I use LinkedIn as kind of an example of the same trend that we're building on top of. Essentially, it started with Google going from directory-based solutions to network-based solutions. That's what made Google Google. And you could say that this is also what made LinkedIn. Before LinkedIn, you looked for jobs based on the content of your CV and not the network of relationships that you have. So you could say, LinkedIn did the same thing for people search that Google did for general search. You can say Utu is extending that same concept or value proposition to all commerce, uh, mostly services is where we're focused by integrating that as infrastructure, all of that relationships knowledge uh, that might be useful when you're on a certain platform. Take something, let's go back to the babysitter example, right? Uh, getting that recommendation from, okay, uh, if we talk about trust infrastructure in its simplest terms, really what we're talking about is a recommendations mechanism that's tied to a very robust feedback mechanism and the intelligence that in the back end that connects those two. And uh, we are making trust evaluations dynamically, person to person, not uh, universally. So in the case of a babysitter, we might look for context factors as well as your relationships to understand who to serve you a relationship from. We're never gonna ask you to trust us, right? We're gonna show you data points, something like, uh, 
um, you know, uh, five of your friends, including Susan, Sarah, Tom, and Steve, have used this babysitter 10 times in the last two months. Uh, giving her or him badges for uh, great cooking, uh, good with small children, and very reliable, and leaving this video feedback as a review of their services. So we're never asking you to trust us. We're just putting the information in front of you that you're most likely to trust at the place where you need it at the time where you need it. So, Jim, can I come in with two other questions related to that? Yeah, please go ahead. So the, the other question is, um, because also from a background where I've done a lot of credit risk analysis, et cetera, yeah. I would want to understand if there's an element of quantitative analysis, not just network, but quantitative analysis where maybe you give some sort of rating across various dimensions that you know, the, your engine works on. That is one. Two, the the... My, what I would also want to understand, and I, I really like your nanny's uh, recommendation uh, model use case because I have kids and I know what it is. The, the, the question is, who gives you quality assurance? Because, you know, uh, some people may have a good relationship, have a lot of recommendation up to what level do you think that, okay, actually this is accurate. What is the QA behind it? Yeah. So we're always putting a human in the loop in the decision making. So even in the mobility business, for instance, we don't, we don't make the assumption that we know and can predict every time which taxi you want, uh, because actually your situation changes based on the context. So it takes something even more sensitive, like a babysitter, and the context matters way more, right? Maybe the context that matters in that case is the age of the child for, of the recommender and the age of your child or their view on parenting. These are things that we probably can't uh, be able to have data on, but a lot of the data that we collect can serve as proxies for it. And at the end of the day, it's you to decide whether you believe this recommendation or that one. In the worst case scenario, we're usually as good as any other recommendation. In, in the best case, we can provide the perfect recommendation from that person who you really agree. It's this theory of the smart, uh, the smart friend, right? You have that smart friend who you always go to for questions about tax or about cooking or about restaurants or about uh, child care. And so you choose kind of the way to find that smart friend of yours uh, through the weeds and through the sea of everything, all the validations that are out there. I hope that's clear. Uh, sorry, you. one point I want to make on the lending bit, because that has been one of our key sectors uh, in terms of the quantitative analysis. Uh, absolutely. So we're blending profile data, relationship data, context data, and transactional history data uh, into sort of a basically a graph database. And we're embedding that type of information in the nodes and the edges of that graph and then optimizing across it. Uh, so for the lending sector, we're doing both peer-to-peer -peer and centralized lending um, providing some credit scoring and profit scoring mechanisms that are then enriched with that social data. So a person makes a lending decision different from an institution. Providing them with a single number credit score is maybe not that useful. If you can provide some helpful context, like this uh, lender is taking this loan to grow tomatoes. They're based in uh, this area. We know from their GPS uh, farmers in that area, there are 400 that have taken loans to grow tomatoes and the so on and so forth. So we try to provide that narrative uh, description of trust. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions from the audience as well. So uh, one question is around the, what value add from, this is uh, Atman Ali. What value add does this provide over plain old WhatsApp? -ing? Yeah. So uh, in the mobility business, we can point very well to some strong metrics, 20% uh, higher conversion rates, 20% higher satisfaction rates, uh, viral, ac a viral acquisition of about 30 invites per new user. Uh, Long-term retention is quite a bit higher. Uh, lifetime value, if you look at the unit economics in our mobility business, they're pretty strong. Um, we have seen that basically across all of the aggregated transactions uh, that the mobility business has done. 
And we're right now we're basically starting to understand how that translates into all of these other sectors. I often say that our goal is to be sector agnostic, uh, but we have to become sector specialists in the meantime. So we're going sector by sector through the key sectors, uh, which are kind of, you can see here to understand exactly do those same types of uplift occur across sectors? Are they unique? And so far it's looking very good. We've learned things, uh, some fascinating things about the nature of trust actually. I know Jim Davidson, you had another question as well. Would you like to chime in? Well, I was just, I mean, what's, I mean, we're sort of at, running out of a little bit of time, use of funds, things like that would be interesting. But one more question on the platform, which is, you know, there's a, there's a difference between whether you trust somebody or not and whether they're an expert or not. And I think Steve got yeah. on, on some of that as well. But I wonder, you know, um, if there's a trust that's based on, on an, on an increasingly small group of incompetent people, how do we deal, you know, are there ways in which the platform could be tweaked and, and support solving problems like fake news and other things that we have with respect to trust, you know, our basic trust in institutions, yeah. not just people. Yeah, yeah, um, that's, uh, it's like I planned you'd ask that question. Uh, <laughs> we're actually working on a, a fake news implementation of our trust engine right now, specifically around COVID and self-reporting of information of conditions and as well as news and information around COVID. Uh, so we're working on that. Um, a big piece of what we do is around privacy. Uh, so that you could say privacy is the other side of trust. And so we're as obsessed with privacy preserving mechanisms as we are with trust. Our goal is not to own everybody's data. Obviously the service is super data hungry. Our goal is not to own people's data. Our goal is to build the infrastructure and the tools that let people take control of that data and make it more useful in service of themselves. And I probably worth mentioning that I don't think I said yet, we are fundraising. Uh, we're raising a million dollars, uh, seven million free money. So what's your ask? Uh, yeah, so we're looking for a million for 12 and a half percent. We have a good portion of the round committed. You'd be joining investors like uh, SoftBank Group's uh, DeepCore Investments. The, uh, we're the first African investment that they've made, uh, AI company, uh, as well as Xeroth AI out of Hong Kong, Eternity Blockchain out of Europe, uh, Keppel Africa Ventures, uh, Artesian from Australia. So there's one other question from the audience that might be some more technical questions from Sean Durkin about architecture, whether it's distributed and whether your APIs are available today and whether they may be tested. Once you answer that, I'd love to give you some of my thoughts and, and where I might stand in terms of investments. Sure. Uh, yeah, there are the core API, depending on which sector you want to deploy it in, is available. It's not available publicly. We still kind of have a wait list for deployments and do all our work privately like that until... Uh, we get a bit further, uh, but we can certainly share the API. Um, and in terms of the architecture, the, the recommendation service, the AI-powered recommendation service is a centralized uh, proprietary service, uh, but we are planning to build uh, almost every other aspect of the pr platform in a decentralized fashion. We have a pretty elaborate white paper uh, going over that. I'm happy to share all the technical content or connect you with our CTO, Dr. Bastian. Okay. Um, any thoughts from Jim or Steve on uh, whether this is an interesting investment that you'd be interested in? Well, I mean, for me, it's not really in my wheelhouse right now where I'm mostly focused on ag supply chain. And, but, you know, sort of, I can see derivative issues of trust around certifications for agriculture that, uh, could, you know, could be adjacent and useful. So I can follow along, but I wouldn't be investing directly at this time. There's actually an ag marketplace that we're working on right now. Yeah. Okay. On my side, Thanks, uh, uh, yeah, on my side, um, again, I'm very much interested. Um, the, the only challenge I have there is, uh, I don't quite get it <laughs> until now. <laughs> and I like understanding things very fully before I commit. So I think I'll have to pause, but I, I think we can continue the conversation. Hopefully sure. I can make it to back, back to Nairobi in, uh, in August or September, depending on when they open, and then we can really meet. Wonderful, look forward to it. And similarly from my side, um, I'd like to understand more. Um, I think one of my key concerns really is um, how much 
revenue traction you have and what your burn rate looks like based on that. Um, you know, I think in Silicon Valley, you can start a company, run it and keep on raising money until you get big. I think it's a little bit harder to do that potentially in, in, in yeah. like Africa. And so yeah. I think, um, number one, I want to really understand the technology, understand the use cases, understand the traction in each of the sectors, but also that there is a clear path and clear runway to profitability because um, unfortunately Nairobi isn't yet like Silicon Valley. And I'd want to make yeah. sure that, um, that uh, there is enough money there to make it happen. So I'd like to keep the conversation going uh, with you, Jason. And I know there's also um, a couple of people in the audience, such as Sean and Brian Dolan, Sean Durkin and Brian Dolan, who are very familiar with uh, the space that um, you know, we could perhaps bring in into the conversation as well. So on that note, uh, you may have noticed there, there is a poll in progress. Um, uh, how much would you invest in Utu? Feel free to keep, um, answering that poll we're going to leave it on for another couple of minutes and then we will show the results any final comments or questions or uh from either of the panelists or from you jason sure i would maybe i would just note um just to respond to your last comment uh, on the revenue bit yeah that's exactly why we still run the mobility business uh because we knew that the utu play was a long-term play when had a long runway to get there and we were never going to be able to raise the amount of money that we would need to actually build that the same way a Silicon Valley company would. So the mobility business, we already had a foundation and was generating some good revenue. We've been able to scale that up pretty well and they're now serving some of the largest corporates in Kenya, like uh, uh, Kenya Commercial Bank, uh, Equity Bank. And we're actually then franchising has been a high margin opportunity to scale that revenue even further leveraging those assets. So we actually think we're going to hit uh, cash flow positive uh, this year uh, with enough uh, with resources in. So happy to have that chat more. Thank you. And we do have a comment from Sean Durkin. Happy to continue evaluating as a customer or as an investment. Interesting nuggets throughout mobility investors. Um, trans is hard. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, uh, franchise is a model we've attempted to. So I think you might have a potential partner or a customer there. Um, Wonderful. And, uh, Sean, I'll definitely put the two of you guys in touch, Sean and Jason. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thanks, Jason. everybody. Cheers. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now and uh, display it uh, so you can all see. As we can see, um, we have uh, a bit of a dumbbell here. We have a lot of people who uh, may not be interested, about a third. And then we have a good third who have expressed uh, some interest as investors. So uh, thank you very much for participating in the poll and thank you, Jason, for presenting. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. All right, on to our next presenter. Benson, are you there? Yep, I'm available. So let me just uh, share the screen. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing mine. Okay. Second. Awesome. Are we good with everyone? Very good. Thank you. We can hear you. And we can't see your video, but we can uh, at least see. I can't get that working right now. Can you see my video right now? You can see your screen. Yes. And now you can see me. Okay. That's good. That's good. That's perfect. All right, awesome. All right. So I'll just kick off. Um, five minutes. So the, all right, thank you. So the two wheel taxi sector, it's uh, in Kenya, we call them uh, border borders, has been growing rapidly. And uh, from different use cases of uh, uh, ride hailing to uh, last mile from different companies and uh, delivery companies, it's growing rapidly. And not only in Kenya, in uh, Africa at large. Uh, so uh, the biggest problem that is not being faced, uh, the elephant in the room, is uh, the accidents that are happening on a daily basis from the same sector. Uh, I'll just dive into one of the main causes for these things. So we have 47% of uh, riders, you can see, they end up in 
permanent injury. If you've ever visited one of the national hospitals where the uh, sector has been designated for riders specifically who have got accidents on the border borders, there's, it's grave. If you look, it's grave. And these guys are, some of them are dying. Uh, most of them are getting permanent injuries and things like this. 15% uh, last year alone, 15% lost their lives who were involved in accidents. And uh, in 38, roughly about 38% will uh, get to hospital, but uh, high chances they'll lose their limbs and things like this. Many, one of the main reasons uh, for them, uh, uh, for this poor emergency response for the sector is uh, because of uh, the qualified medical services from bystanders. So that is on the scene of the accident itself. And then untimely intervention. Time is a big issue uh, when it comes to response time here in Kenya and in Africa at large, I'd like to say. Then mismanagement of casualty at the scene itself. So uh, main reasons, again, communication barrier, intervention time is low, and uh, payments being a big problem for these riders because of the money that they earn. And therefore, last year alone, again, 20% road accidents were from border borders, 270 deaths in total, and over 4 million dependents. By dependents, I mean these are uh, children and uh, wives of these same riders uh, who depend on them for a living that get affected directly when these people are involved in accidents and uh, don't get to work normal and their money. Uh, in uh, Kenya, there's over 1.5 million uh, border border riders and the numbers are growing so fast. Africa at large, you can see Uganda at 500k, 2 million in uh, SA and uh, Nigeria growing fast as well with over a million riders. Uh, who are in this nature of business and uh, still with low regulations. What we're doing, um, we have a couple of competitors in the field who are doing exactly almost what we're doing, but uh, uh, they, we'll start with the national health who are giving affordable care, but at the same time, you can't rely on them strictly and uh, the quality of care because it's national health uh, might not be at the peak of uh, services. And uh, this Riziki, it's a private... Uh, institution, but then the problem with them is they might be affordable and have quality, but uh, they can't be 100% reliable when the accidents just happen. They still depend on traditional emergency response services. Then everyone will run to the family, of course, call them for help uh, when you're involved in an accident, but family cannot come and respond to you when you're injured in the field. So what we're doing as right safe is we want to build a fast intervention uh, process, leveraging on a wider network of fast responders on our platform attractable payment plans, so enabling these people to be able to pay distributed costs over a period of time and uh, access care whenever they're involved in accidents. So the value we propose to them is uh, we have a big platform which has a lot of fast responders on them so they can get increased hospital options and uh, less intervention time, of course, because we're trying to decentralize the emergency response space. And they can guarantee, we can guarantee care because we follow up on the people on the platform who get to respond to these riders when they're involved in accidents. The people who work with closely are hospitals. This might be no clinics or even middle-level uh, hospitals, ambulances. And uh, in the near future, we want to work with EMTs who are qualified to uh, perform emergency response. So uh, these will be more decentralized because you will find individuals who can actually respond in a shorter period of time, uh, depending on the location where they'll be. We have an uh, Android app that's already launched. It was launched early this year. Uh, this will be a writer's application uh, interface. They have their profiles and a quick SOS uh, button that you can press in case they're involved in accidents. And they can be able to rate uh, the care that they get when they feel better. Our first responders app as well, they get to be zoning at all times for incidents within their region. And uh, they can perform treatments in the same application and see their ratings as well. And all this uh, geared towards reducing intervention time. We are leveraging on blockchain as well. I'll just slide quickly through this. Uh, a couple of features we want to put on the blockchain is incentivize the rider for good behaviors and uh, if possible have smart contracts between the riders and the first responders uh, to just guarantee quality and uh, payment is made only when uh, the specific service of a specific type of injury has been delivered in the right way. Um, yep, this is just a repetition of the same things. Yeah, um, so I'll just jump through through our projections. Uh, currently, we are at 170 riders on our platform since we launched early this year. But our goals are to reach to 10,000 by the end of this year. And uh, if we look at a five-year uh, projection of the plans we've had, depending on the growth patterns of put-up, we're looking to be making up to 7.5 million in revenues from the collection. These riders, they pay monthly fees. Uh, it's a subscription-based uh, model of money. So some milestones we've been able to make, we launched our platform uh, Sorry, we incorporated our company last year, but one. 
in May. And uh, up to now, we have been able to do a USSD pilot where we had over 600 members sign up for. And uh, we have partnered with a couple of uh, organizations that uh, have groups of medical, cent medical centers and as well EMTs who can respond to incidents. We were able to close seed funding in early 2019 with uh, Eternity Ventures as well for 100K, which has helped us to quickly uh, develop the application and uh, do awareness in the field and also reach the level we are right now. And we launched our application early this year. Yep. And currently, we are trying to raise 300K to be able to help us to scale countrywide. But my ask for this uh, specific nest is uh, 50K to 25K in convertible notes at a valuation of a million dollars. Uh, we'll use this money to scale our services uh, within the Nairobi County. We want to reach up to 20,000 paying riders and uh, also want to develop our IAS version of the app and launch it. And also increase our ratio of first aiders to casualty rapidly so that we can have a more distributed and decentralized uh, emergency response platform. And um, then finally start a countrywide target campaign, uh, trying to get to the rest of the country and reach the different riders in other, in other counties in, Nairobi, in Kenya. Sorry. So the partners so we have so far we're running out of time. So uh, yeah, I've come from uh, different uh, from media guys who have been talking about us, and a couple of medical centers who are partnered with, and organizations that are helping us in the response. This is my team: uh, me, Jassy, our COO, our CTO, Chencha, Lisbeth Becker, our senior advisor, and Judge Kuboy, our Radio relations personnel. So thank you very much, and hope uh, we can have some people join us in helping these people and reducing innovation time or manage the time. Thank you. Thank you, Benson. Well, over to uh, the panelists. Uh, who would like to go first? Steve, Jim? Steve, you want to go first? Yeah, I was going to go first. Thank you. So um, thank you for the presentation, uh, Benson. I, actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was actually a rider uh, in, in Nairobi until uh, I got stuck <laughs> in Ghana. Uh, so I use what I've done etc. quite extensively. Yeah. So I've got. Yeah. I mean, I, I in principle I like the model. I like. I see what you're doing, and essentially the emergency response to riders or yeah. bikers uh, in Nairobi yes. and uh, extending you know, globally even. So that yeah. that I think is a valuable thing. But I, I, I've got two questions for you that are critical. I think in your model. Uh, one. Yes, please. Uh, with the existing ride sharing apps don't they have insurance cover no. and this service already there that is one two why not integrate with those like the say borders the ubers and uh, little cabs yeah. and uh, all of those people that service why do we something very separate that's the second point yeah and essentially yeah. the the emergency response is it with, as you mentioned, yeah. is in part, partnership with the ambulances, et cetera. But what has been the uptake? Yeah. Because riders, they're, I was going to say they're stingy. They, you know, <laughs> they don't want to pay, right? You're yeah, right. So, okay. All right. I'm listening. I'm, I'm listening. Yeah. So let me just start with the, the BT. You mentioned about why work alone and not partner with already existing platforms that are offering uh, ride healing services. Uh, currently to us, you're just talking about something we have been discussing for the past uh, three weeks. Uh, currently to us, the ride hailing companies, these are our direct clients, actually. That's how we look at it. Because uh, we, we started earlier on, we were doing B2C, trying to you know, get the riders as individuals, and we got to realize it's hectic. You're right, they are stingy. And maybe they might not try to understand the value, because what's insurance penetration is very low within their demographic. And so they don't want to understand you know, clearly well, what, what is this product and what exactly does it do. And why should I pay my money for it? But then we try to look at, you know, a B2B model where we are looking at uh, organizations or companies that are already dealing, they have a form, format way of, of how to collect fees from these people. They are already, people, are already, people need them for paying them for some service or something like this. And uh, in, the, in light to this, as we speak right now, we are in talks with an Ethiopian-based uh, ride-hailing company. It's called Taxi. Eh? Uh, they are just launching in Kenya as T-Border. And uh, we, we are actually in talks and we are very close to integrating and uh, signing up a, a document and being partners so that we can provide for them the SOS services. And uh, uh, people like uh, the, the former speaker, Mr. Jason from Utu, we have had talks. Uh, they, have not, they are close to launching the Boda Boda uh, ride hailing as well from Cubs. And this is something that once they launch, we will be integrating. Uh, so yes, uh, Amen. We need to integrate with these people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, Jason. 
we need to be integrating with these people for future growth. Uh, people like Sefra and um, Bolt, we, we have had a couple of meetings, but I guess we still have to have a couple more to get to the level of integration. But apart from that, we're also working with the savings group. You understand these border borders, they have things called circles and chairmen. And so we try to work with these groups. So uh, having a group of 10, 20, 100 paying us for this service and we could just respond to them as well. So this, this is something that we're looking to very closely and actually are working on it as we speak. And uh, for emergency response, how, what the uptake of um, uh, the, the, the responders themselves, that's what you're asking, right? So for, for the responders, to them, it's just another revenue model to them. So it has not been so hard for us to convince them to actually join the platform. And uh, so we, are, we work both with uh, medical centers and as well as ambulance services. And we are trying to decentralize it more to go to work with individuals, EMTs, who when they are off duty, they can actually just jump on the app and, you know, the way you wait for a ride hailing trip to come, so you can wait for an emergency to happen. And you know you're equipped and you know you can always respond. So in the case of this, the, the uptake is good and the people are actually very positive towards uh, this kind of uh, uh, thing. Okay. Jim, would you like yeah. to well, <clears throat> answer your questions? Well, I, mean, I had a similar question around the B2B model, which makes tons of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I've taken yeah. a few motos in, in Rwanda and, and I and I get the the yeah. Uh, but I, I wanted to understand a little bit more. We yeah. Spoke about this, but a little bit more about the the selection and onboarding of the EMTs, and and it you know yeah. the last presentation we talked about quality and trust, and yet if you're injured, you can't really be in yeah. selection. Yeah. So how do you know that the yeah. person that arrives is qualified? And yeah. So we, we, we have KYC that we actually go, that the EMTs have to go through. So if it's a medical center, they, on, the, on the platform, on the application, they'll have to, you know, sign up their location, sign up their qualification, upload their documentation. And then we'll, at one point, so the, the onboarding is a bit slower than onboarding the riders because at one point we have to have someone visit the site and actually check the emergency response, uh, uh, their room, for example, their emergency room, how does it look like? Do they have enough bandages? You know, are they up to standard? things like this. Do they have an ambulance with them at the center or not? So that you can know how to redistribute the available ambulances within the specific region to these other small centers and things like this. So yeah, these are very strict KYC before we can actually turn them into uh, 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 users on the platforms or responders to the platform. When it comes to the, to the EMTs, the EMTs, this is, we have not yet started this kind of uh, model, but then we will come to that near closely. We're still looking at how to verify and maybe even working with Putu will help us to improve on the trust on this. But we need to know if this uh, person is still performing, you know, when did his license expire and uh, what's his track record over time, you know. So these are key things that we're going to be monitoring uh, when we're doing our uh, KYCs with these uh, EMTs as individuals. But for now it's much easier because we're working with medical centers and just ambulance services. So this is, uh, they are already qualified and it's easier to just collect the information and know if they exist and they'll be able to respond to the nearest uh, incident around them. Rely on the existing certifications, as it were, and then a spot check of the facilities. Yes, and things like that. And just some small uh, checkups just to know if they're up to standard to our specification. Yeah. yeah, very cool. Yeah. There's a question from the audience and from Brian Dolan. The notion of rewarding the driver for good behavior is the inverse yes. incentive to report the incidents. Doesn't that Pardon? nullify the value of the app? Pardon, the what? Doesn't that nullify the value of the app? And Brian, if you'd like to clarify if I'm not asking that correctly, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, there are two yeah. things that, are, that, are, uh, I, that I don't understand. First of all, I don't think this needs blockchain. I don't, I don't see why there needs to be a blockchain solution to this. I think it needs just yeah. be a database. There's not an invasion yeah. of trust to, to the best that I can see. Um, that's yeah. one, and, and somebody else has that. And number two, if you're trying yeah. to reward the, the, you're basically doing an insurance underwriting play if you're doing rewarding for good behavior, but you want people yeah. to report the incident. So how do you balance yeah. that? People don't call their insurance because they don't want it to go on their record. So yeah. how do you balance that out? Well, so uh, basically the incentive is, uh, <laughs> if, you're involved in an, if you're involved in an accident, I, I number one, I doubt you will not call because you want to get an incentive. I'm sure you will rush to use the platform because after all, you're paying for it. But then, well, um, then the incentive is... is my, point. my point is I wouldn't pardon? sign up to 
an app. I wouldn't sign up to an app that's going to permanently report my crash. Is my point. Like it's sort of like the wrong incentive, in my opinion. I mean, I might be missing something. I miss a lot of things. But this one sounds yeah. like uh, <laughs> there might not be a reason to sign up if I'm just getting bad grades. Uh, yeah, I, I know, I know. So the, the the point is this: you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, saving a life. So you you might have a choice to use the SOS or not to. We're not reporting this incident to you. We're not reporting you for bad driving. You're reporting because you need help. You see, so you, you can maybe choose to use the orange, the orange traditional methods, which currently you can look at the numbers. Uh, they're not good. You know, the, the accidents are happening right, left, and center. So the incentive model is just basically a long-term kind of thing that, you know, you've gone a year, you've gone two years of an accident, you've been paying for subscription. You see something like this. We, we incentivize you in some format of way just to encourage, you know, good behavior. Hey, maybe, you know, you ride well, you know, you get incentivized. Or we give you a discount on your subscription, something like this. So I, I don't know how it will discourage the, the rider from, you know, because you're not taking track of their bad driving, actually. Maybe in the near future, we'll want to take track of their bad driving so to increase their rates. <laughs> yeah, but then for now, it's just, uh, it's just an, a long-term thing. You know, after two years of good driving, you, know, you just have to be rewarded for behaving well on the platform, something like this. So, so I have some questions on the defensibility side of things. You know, as uh, Jim and Steve have already pointed out, this is something that uh, uh, you always need to work with the ride-sharing companies with um, yes. and, um, and for distribution. Um, yes. And unless you already have a very large network of qualified EMTs, which is an asset of yeah. themselves, what yeah. kind of ability yeah. do you have um, for yeah. one of the insurance companies or even one of the mobility companies to come in? Right? <coughs> yeah. The ride sharing companies come in and just offer the same thing. Yeah, so uh, what we're doing right now with the current ride sharing apps that are available when they go to the SOS, they're working with the traditional, the already existing uh, ambulance services for response. The reason why we have a couple of interest from some of the ride sharing, ride hailing uh, companies is because uh, we are taking advantage of uh, the small medical centers. We're going wider, we're spreading wider. From yesterday's presentation from one of the entrepreneurs, uh, you could see they explained to you the number of small clinics that are popping up all over Nairobi, all over Kenya. These are all, uh, to us, they're all nodes of help, nodes of emergency response, because we have incidents where a person is injured from across the street, but they'll never know that there are five medical centers just across the other side of the street. Why? Because uh, they, they, they have crammed that when this person has been knocked, however small injury is, they'll rush them to the government facility. Because why? He's a rider, number one. He might not have money on them. And usually when you treat a rider, it turns out to become a bad debt. <laughs> it can, it's a curse. But then we have to break this curse by you know, letting them know that we have, we have a wider network. We're going down to the lowest person who can actually come and at least have some medical knowledge, can put your head right, can put your arm right, and avoid further damage and things like this. And when you explain to these people this thing, they see the value in it. They're like, ah, so you guys are there for the first five minutes. And that's what we want to sell right now. So I think that's uh, a plus for us. On top of this, uh, just uh, last year, we were in talks with um, uh, two bodies that have each almost over 300 medical centers under them, small lab. They are private practitioners who have medical centers. And so they, they are all on plan to onboard. And this year, we're going to be uh, going hard on onboarding them. So we're very close to signing an MOU and things like this. So this will increase our as uh, AMT or responder platform very wide. And that is to us is our biggest uh, asset. Great, well, thank you very much, Benson. Um, I, as the audience may have seen, I've, I've launched a poll on uh, whether you would invest in ride or not. What, what, was the, um, what was the ask again, Jim? I, in yeah, Benson. what is the ask? Can you repeat the ask again, Benson? Uh, so we um, just put it up again. Uh, currently, like I said, we're raising $300,000 to help us to scale countrywide. But my ask for this uh, specific nest is uh, 50K in convertible notes, 50 to 25K in convertible notes, and uh, at a valuation cap of a million dollars. And those are the things we want to do. And how much of this uh, coming round have you already raised? We raised 100K last year beginning of 2019 with Eternity Ventures. And uh, uh, that is the only amount of race so far. So 
this will be the second time we're raising. Okay. Yes, please. Steve, Jim, thoughts? Um, uh, as for me, uh, I think, again, compared to the previous uh, presentation, uh, I'm very much interested. Um, I could put five to 10K, uh, depending on the further conversation we can have uh, with Benson. So well, I think we need to take this conversation offline and uh, get a bit more detail on the revenue model and the potential uh, for growth. And there are a few other companies I think we can work with that would help in lo longer term. Yeah, actually, also uh, getting help with, uh, you know, partnerships with different companies that work in the same model would be much of a bigger assist to help us, you know, just even grow as an yeah, individual. So that's something to look forward to. Sounds great. We'll, we'll definitely put uh, you in touch. Uh, thank thank yeah. you. Yeah, like I said, I'm not really in this. Yeah, I have some investments, but I am intrigued. And I also... I like the clarity of your ask. <laughs> this <amount laughs> of money and this use of funds, I appreciate that. So I might be interested in a little bit um, as well to follow up later. Great. Right. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Hey, from my perspective, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, this isn't really an area that I've uh, looked much into or um, if there and not much overlap with what we're doing at Untap. So I, I think I'm out for the time being. Uh, although I'd love to right. keep track of your progress and um, you know, yeah. in the future. Good luck. All right. Thank, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great. Well, on that thank note, you. You know, there's a poll happening right now. 30 out of 62 have voted on um, whether you would invest in MobileSafe. I'm going to leave that up a little bit longer while, while we get ready for Sebastian to come on board as well. <coughs> Just to give you a quick um, update on the results. Um, so we have um, about a third, 32%, uh, who have said no. Uh, a couple of people who have said they're interested in larger investment. And um, a few, um, about a third, uh, anywhere from 1,000 to uh, 25,000. So, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, given where you are, given the, the valuation, you know, perhaps some small investments could be useful for you, Benson. Thank you thank very you. much for voting. Thank you for presenting. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Over to you, Sebastian. Thanks a lot, Jim. Um, create a network, share electricity, bright in the future. That's the motto of Solch. And I'm going to take you through a quick ride to the future of energy, really. And um, that here from uh, out of Bangladesh. And uh, you assigned me five minutes. So I put up basically uh, five points to discuss vision, market opportunity, product and social impact, long-term profitability, and of course the ask. And to dive right into it, I wanna introduce you to this young lady here, um, Maya. So that, that picture was taken in 2015. And what's special about Maya is, um, among many things, is that she was the first person on the planet Rate her excess solar electricity with her neighbors and got the benefit of that in real time onto her mobile phone. Um, Maya was part of the first peer-to-peer -peer energy exchange platform in the world, which was uh, uh, gone online here in Bangladesh in a remote village in, in 2015. And I want to stress a little bit the point of implications of that, uh, the implications for a uh, systemic change, how we think of energy, how we use energy and how we pay for energy. So imagine if all the people in a, a future of energy scenario have distributed assets, meaning in terms of solar PV panels, um, have uh, batteries, could be Tesla power walls, or could be the, the millions of systems we have here in Bangladesh, which are lead asset batteries. And if you build a trading platform out of they, those and generate a synergy effect, so. In Bangladesh, there are 6 million solar home systems. So the synergy effect of 6 million is 1 plus 1 is 3, we learn in school on synergy. So just imagine the power you could unleash from that, uh, globally speaking, of all the distributed assets. So th that as the vision for the systemic change um, we are trying to initiate here. Moving on, on the opportunity. So I just said there are 6 million solar home systems. What we found is, um, 
that a solar home system on average has about 30% three zero of excess energy. What is excess energy? It basically means it's two or 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Your battery is full, but the sun is still shining. A bigger battery is not an idea for, for multiple reasons in the rainy season and so forth. So if you calculate all that up, on, in a year, you have about a billion dollars of energy which is wasted or dumped load, which is untapped. And um, that's the opportunity we're trying to tap into here uh, in Bangladesh. And just to give you a, a little bit of a reality check, what such a solar home system looks like, what density looks like, and what 30 million solar home systems in the most densely populated country in the world looks like. It's really dense. This is a marketplace you see here. And only in this frame on your laptop right now, you see 53 solar home systems in a very narrow place. Moving on um, to the solution. So if we have a billion dollars to tap into, our initial thought was just, okay, there are some people who don't have anything. They don't have access to electricity. There's no electricity grid. We're speaking of off-grid areas. And then we have people who have systems, but are somehow constrained in their use, sometimes need more power, sometimes less. So if I can put them together and build a grid out of these systems by interconnecting them, so I, then I get a platform where solar home systems can exchange the electricity seamlessly between users and non-users. So whenever I need more power, I buy it. And whenever I need less, um, uh, I can sell it or my system sells it. And that's all wrapped into a solution um, by, uh, by Solshare, which means that any trading is automatically settled on your mobile phone through the Vcash uh, mobile wallet in Bangladesh, which by now is the biggest in the world, has just surpassed M-Pesa. So we're building on two world records piggybacking. One is Six million solar home systems, which is a world record. And the other one is the mobile money uh, infrastructure. We're trying to put them together in a sharing economy-like model. How does it look like in reality? Um, this is the smart meter you see in the middle. Um, on the right bottom side, just as an example, you see the um, uh, laughing uh, Bimolda. He's a, he's a pharmacist. Uh, right now in COVID, he's one of the busiest people in his village. And we want to really make sure that his lights stay on. Uh, not only the lights, also the, um, the nebulizers for oxygen supply. So this is really the time where it, it, uh, uh, it has become even more critical in those areas. Um, moving on on the social impact side, we had a Singapore social impact investor uh, come over to do an assessment, an SROI assessment, so-called. It's uh, uh, by IIX, the Impact Investment Exchange. That's a social return on investment. And what they came up with is for every dollar invested into one of those soul share grids, you have a social return on investment of about $4.85. So that's 485% in uh, social return. And moving on to the uh, fourth part, uh, the long-term profitability. So the model is a, we sell the meter B2B to those organizations who have installed the solar home systems, which helps us on the cash flow. And then we, on the platform, for every kilowatt hour which is traded between the houses, we take a trading fee. So that's, that's the analogy to the, uh, uh, to the sharing economy model. So we there um, expect a steady prosumer growth. Prosumer means a solar home system owner, sometimes a producer, sometimes a consumer, and a hybrid form of that. And, and that coupled with a strong increase in, in trading. And then we make sure that we are aligned with our business partner, so we share the trade volume fee with our business partners, so we both are fully aligned that the platform needs to grow. Um, we have some good scope for geographical expansion. We've already uh, uh, set up two grids in, in India by now, next to the 30 grids we have in Bangladesh. And as a B2B play, with the larger scale, the R&D and the staff cost um, are offset, which will bring us to profitability. And talking about that in terms of the financing requirement, uh, uh, the ask and the use of funds, um, this is the slide usually where investors, Jim, is already looking closer, where they look closer. So we are trying to raise a round of uh, 2.75 million. And um, that is projected uh, to last us for, for three years, which is the time we need to reach uh, profitability um, under, the, under the given assumptions. Um, in terms of what is already secured, all our existing investors have said that they go pari passo. We have about $750,000 in committed capital there through safe notes. Um, we have about $350,000 secured in grants and we're looking for a, 
uh, new investor to build a book um, of about $450,000. Um, to throw something in, we have a current scheme in Bangladesh that for in any dollar I get in angel investment here uh, uh, on the nest, we have a good opportunity to get a match fund here um, funded through the uh, Swiss Development Corporation. So uh, up to a maximum of $100,000. Uh, that brings us to 1.65, um, which leaves us with another 1.1 which we leave uh, rather for the end of the year up to Q1 2021, once the COVID situation has calmed a little bit down. And um, so right now it's, it's building the book. So the ask here for the nest is to be part of this $450,000 uh, through a safe note, um, which has a good potential to get matched here uh, through the SDC. Um, mm -hmm. That's it from my side, because it's the five minutes is, I think, done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for your presentation. Uh, just really quick clarification on the numbers you just showed. Uh, is there a cap on the valuation um, for the? Yeah. So yeah. So the safe the safe note uh, agreed with the current shareholders is that we will have a cap at seven point two five million. Seven point two five. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, over to Steve, Jim. Who would like to go first? Jim, well, come on. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just quick question. So, um, I am wondering about the. Uh, you, you mentioned the two to three o'clock during the day. There's a lot of sun and the storage. I'm just trying to understand a little bit more of the storage, like how mm -hmm. much can people really rely on this? Um, and then also, I'm curious. I was in Dhaka before, and I just remember wires everywhere. <laughs> you know, wires along the street. Um, you know, poles falling down. Who owns the wires? Who owns like the little mini grid between all these micro connected houses? Who's responsible for the maintenance of, of the device mm -hmm. and, the, um, and the warranty of the device? You know, the quality of this little micro grid. How, the... Yeah, sure. Th thanks, Jim. So I, I know the two questions. First on the storage. Um, the beauty of the Bangladeshi system is that the solar home system sector, the success of the 6 million uh, systems was very heavily regulated with strong design criteria, quality insurance uh, by a semi-governmental body, which is called ITCOL. And that means that all those systems basically have the same system design specifics, which means you should have three days of autonomy, which means when, uh, that your battery lasts you for three days. That's the, that's the ideal case. So the batteries are actually fairly, fairly big, but nonetheless, they still go full at, at, at 3 p.m. And there's a reason for that. So usually, intuition would be, let's just buy a bit of ba uh, bigger battery or let's just buy a second battery. Both are uh, not good ideas. Bigger battery means that you will never fully charge it and those are lead acid batteries, which means when you never fully charge them, they will sulfurate and they will break down uh, fairly quickly and it's the most expensive asset. A second battery is also not a really good idea because you can't put them together. They will perform as good as the worst uh, performing battery. That's why we're really solving a problem of flexibility, of modularity. And um, so that's one of the key uh, uh, value propositions here on the, uh, in response to your storage side. On the wires, yes, we have uh, chaos wiring here in Taka as well as in, in many other emerging markets in the capitals. We are operating in the off-grid sector, so where the national grid hasn't reached yet. So the way it works is these, when I say we piggyback on 6 million solar home systems, what I mean is the infrastructure in terms of assets, batteries and PV panels, but also the very successful organizations who have put those systems into the field. So for instance, our, our biggest customer is Grameen Shakti from the Nobel laureate uh, Mohammed Yunus. They have 2 million solar home systems only under their hood. We have started to interconnect. We have 20 grids with them and uh, want to have about 100 by mid, uh, mid next year. So they are our business partner. They have 20 years of experience how to sell those systems, how to maintain them, and how to run the show in the villages. And we don't, we are not, we, 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 uh, we don't claim that we can do that any better. And that's why piggybacking, which means also, I'm not buying any wire. It's Ramin Shakti who's doing that. I'm selling them my meter and tell them, look, I manage the grid remotely because every meter is an IoT device. And we share the benefits from that because I know you have to run the show on the ground. Got it. Thanks. Sebastian, I love the fact that you're making money both on the sale of the meters as well as on the trading platform. What do the economics look like on the trading side? And I think one of the uh, audience members also asked a similar question. 
how much uh, from Agnes uh, McKenna, how much are you uh, charging or uh, what are the trading fees per kilowatt hour? Yeah, yeah. So um, right now, uh, to be, I mean, we have been running this for a couple of years, but in terms of data, we are still a little bit in the dark. So what we said is, okay, look, if I don't have a solar home system, what solution could I have? I could have a solar lantern or something like that. If I have a system and I need a marginal extra unit of energy, how much would I be ready to pay? So the reference value was before the, the rudimentary trading we saw. Now, and what is the, when I buy a solar home system and I have to find it over 24, 36 months, what is the um, average cost of generation there? And this is, so we said, if, if we make it too expensive, then it doesn't make sense for people who don't have an asset. If we make it too cheap, it doesn't make sense to invest into new solar home systems. So we, we have to see both sides. So the price is around about at about a dollar a kilowatt hour, and the trading fee is 25%. So you sell, um, uh, you sell for a, for a dollar and you buy for a dollar 25. It's all through mobile money. So uh, um, it deducted from one meter, it's put on another meter and, uh, and uh, 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 the trading fee directly goes into our master wallet. That's how it, how it works. It's pretty, pretty seamless. Like if you have an Uber ride, you don't really know what so is happening. 25, 25. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, Steve, did you have any comments or questions? Yeah, I, I had a couple. So uh, two things. Uh, one, I would really want to understand from what you've described, the, uh, the mechanism by which the one the load setting, I'm sure there must be the different sets of loads, etc. So how do you manage that? Mm -hmm. And secondly, have you thought about selling to the grid? Because ultimately, if you're off grid, the grid is going to come at some point. And so have you planned an integration with the grid negotiation with the, the main grid? And so what, what, is, what is the outline in that area? Uh, and I have a couple of other questions, but for now, let's get these ones on. Well, see, those were two really good questions. And um, I mean, obviously, and that's why I said in the beginning, it's kind of uh, a peek into the future of energy. We have the same problems than a national grid has. We have obviously a lot of loads which are switched on at 6 p.m. when all the people come home, switch on their, their lights, TVs, and so forth. We're trying to address this through multiple things. First of all, diversification is king also in our grids. If I have a couple of day laborers, a couple of people who run their business from house, if I have a couple of loads like uh, 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 water pumping and, 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 and crop processing, which runs more during the day, this is all good for our platform. So what I need to do is I basically need to give Ramin Shakti as a customer the intelligence to say, okay, I need more storage, sell more batteries. I need more generation, sell more PV. I need more daily load, try to sell more this. Or I can see in this house, he is topping up a lot of money. He seems to be liquid, uh, but uh, by, his, uh, by his temperature, he might need a fan, go to his house and sell a fan. So this is kind of the intelligence we can, we can offer, which is all to do with grid management. But we obviously, we face, we face the same challenges than, than any uh, grid operator or grid manager, which is a, which is a really good uh, and, and healthy exercise. On the national grid question, um, right on. Um, there is strong grid electrification going on, both in India as well as in Bangladesh. And a few of our grids actually have been now overtaken by the national grid. So now it's interesting how this works because they're not complementary yet. So we applied for a regulatory sandbox to be allowed to hook it to the national grid. And um, the play we have here is uh, under the, the hashtag recover better of the, the post-COVID world really is, we have a proposition for an energy policy where we say, can we negotiate a so-called community power purchase agreement for a selection of let's say 100 solar home systems, which feed together into the grid because the single solar home system of 50 watt, 100 watt, it doesn't make technological or economical sense to feed in it. It's too expensive to get, to, to get the setup. But if I combine 100, I can feed it in in one, what we call point of common coupling. And if I get a higher CPPA price, off taker price, then this becomes a post COVID pro poor and renewable energy policy because these guys could be net off takers from the grid. That means they get more from the grid, but pay a much multiple less price, but sell a lot more, uh, sorry, sell less, but get more money. So you are taking more electricity from the grid, but you're saying you end up with more money in your pocket. So this is something we're floating towards the uh, authorities here. 
Um, technically, it's, it's working. We have de developed the prototype of this point of common coupling and we're just waiting for the regulatory approval for the sandbox to, to try it out. So, uh, Atman Ali asked a similar question or made that similar remark about the regulatory system. And so it sounds like you're in regular dialogue with the re uh, regulatory authorities. Okay. That's right, yeah. And sorry, Steve, I think you had a comment or a question. Yeah, I had another question. So thank you very much for the answers. It gives me a bit of visibility. One of the reasons why I mentioned asking those questions, I was one of the early investors into the solar now, the, uh, the uh, Mobi Souls, et cetera, in Africa. So mm -hmm. I see the future of energy exactly the way you say it. I think one of the advantages of Bangladesh is, as you mentioned, everything is standardized. So my question to you is, if you were to come to Africa, and unfortunately, even within one country, you may have different devices with different batteries, you know, there's competition, right? So how would yes. you integrate that into an ecosystem where there's a lot of competition and the devices and the batteries are very, very different? True that, yeah. I mean, and, and that's basically, that is the, the, the challenge we have on if we are truly a platform, obviously we don't want to design it as, a, as an Apple product. We want to make it as integratable as possible. So we have early on being in conversation with the Willem Solar now, the Thomas's from Mobisol, the MCOPAS and so forth to make sure that what are their pain points? And they have, a, I mean, these are fantastic companies. They have a lot of intelligence on their platforms. So how can we make our a, a platform modular enough that we can tap certain modules that say only the training because they don't need our intelligence on loads and they, they, they can do that probably better than we can because they have more years and, and, and more units uh, deployed there in East Africa. But how can the, only the training module be integrated with them? So that's the, that's the challenge we have to have, but that's that we have to, uh, that we have to meet because that's a requirement in order to go, be able to go into such a market as, as uh, Sub-Saharan Africa as a, as a B2B player. Thank you. Um, maybe you mentioned this, but uh, what's your what's your current burn? How much are you? Uh, are you how close are you to profitability? Yeah. So um, we our burn right now is forty thousand dollars. We reduced it by about uh, uh, forty percent uh, uh, since since COVID COVID arrived. Uh, that was a strong mandate, and we managed that. Um, and in terms of profitability, I mean, uh, uh, hands on the heart, it's, it, it'll take us, it's, it's a platform. And that's, that's why the, the big ask of uh, 2.75, we estimate based on our model that it will take us three years uh, to, to hit uh, 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 profitability. And is your main revenue driver from the trading or from the device sales? Definitely, and in the projections, definitely the trading, um, the device sales. I, it's, it's. I, I often say it's kind of the Wi-Fi router, right? You don't want to make money on the Wi-Fi router. You want to make money by selling internet. Okay. Great. Um, there's a couple of questions um, from. Well, one, one question that I had before I asked some of the ones from this audience. Um, have you explored bringing some of this to other markets, in, including Africa? Um, and uh, to what extent have you already had discussions? How far are they along, if, if any? So um, right now it's a theoretical exercise that to make sure that uh, our platform is not built for us, but built as a, as a B2B product. Um, we get a lot of requests, but uh, to be frank, it would, uh, uh, I don't think it would be strategically wise to, to make that jump now. We have to figure out, we have to do our homework here um, South Asia with Bangladesh and with this move into India, really, the two gigantic markets. And I think we, we should figure out a sustainable business model here before uh, suggesting such a move, but always, of course, with one step in the future, keeping in mind uh, uh, in the product design and the tweaks um, that, this is, that this will be a step we will take. Okay. Let me read a question or a comment from um, from the audience, uh, what about theft and piracy of the electricity? Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a major problem for the grid. Uh, this is a question from Sean Durkin. And Sean, feel free to chime in if you want a clarification. 
um, yeah, how do you deal with that? Um, is, does the data help? Um, so, I mean, let me first give you the, 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 the soft answer, uh, not, not the data answer yet. Um, I, people tend to steal from the national grid because the national grid is some kind of invisible body, right? It's a, probably a, a semi-governmental body and it is. People do not tend to steal so much from each other, from your neighbor, because you're living next to him and he's very much visible to you. So, and that holds true. So our data indicates we have, we have theft, but very, very little. Um, and that is basically a peer-to-peer -peer network means my cable runs to my neighbor. And if I tap in there, that neighbor will see it. And even if he doesn't, I will see it because I have all the data uh, in, the, in the back end. So yes, when we see stealing, we do a phone call and say, look, you know, you know mate, I, I, I can see what you're doing there, but it's not as big of a problem as we were fearing, to be honest. And I think it's largely because it's not this big invisible utility. It's also not a mini grid with some external investors. These solar home systems are the people's. This is their own systems. Yeah, no, and I, I, I definitely can, um, can vouch for that effect, the community effect and people being accountable to their neighbors is a, is a very, very, very strong force. Okay. Well, very good. Um, thank you for the questions, audience. Um, and Jim, Steve, thoughts? So, yeah, I, I really like the model, to be honest. I wish it was in Africa. <laughs> that would be my, my comment. I, I'll be monitoring and seeing what you're doing now. But you know, as soon as you you want to come to uh, to the continent, I'll be the first to to give you some insight as to uh, you know who to speak to and how to 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 bring it over. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. And I might even get back to you right away to know a little bit more on the on the pain points from your point of view, given your experience in investing in in, in some of the some of the very good companies. Uh, Thanks, Steve. Jim, did you have a comment, or I'm, I'm happy to jump in if? Uh... No, no. I was just. I think I had a glitch on my. my no, I think the the model is very clever. Um, I'm I'm curious about the reliability uh, of of the devices. You know, sort of what the. Well, how, how, how difficult it would be to maintain these networks and, and whatnot. Um, but I, and I'm also quite surprised about the scope of solar rollout in, in Bangladesh. I haven't been there in a long time and it's, it's a very encouraging to hear. And then you did mention this notion of finding, you know, things that could be, you know, off take for when there's peak mm -hmm. and a very interesting comments with respect to batteries, you know, water pumping, you know, things that matter in, in Bangladesh. You can, there's not a lot of pump storage in Bangladesh, you know. So what else can you do? I, all very interesting. So I would like to hear a little bit more and get a chance. On my side, this, I, I, this is great. I, I, I love what you've done uh, with the concept and the, the many, many possible directions, whether it's on the data side, on the integration side. I also like the fact that you've, um, you have a business model that has a, a, some flexibility. Uh, and I think most importantly, you use the word untapped over there. So just for that reason alone. <laughs> um, you, you know, I think uh, you know, a little bit of background, you know, what we're trying to do is uh, create a better way to do asset financing. And I think there's a lot of synergy between what uh, you will need to scale up, uh, what utilities or even communities will need to be able to finance any of these systems initially. And what we're trying to do in terms of bringing more capital in hard assets that can be secured. Um, on top of that, I love the data side of, of things and I love the possibilities that that creates. And, um, and I really do hope that we can bring this over to Africa. Um, so Steve, when we're ready to do that, I, I, we, we definitely should speak. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm in, I'd like to do an investment. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I would say uh, pending a, a, a more thorough due diligence on your financials and numbers, I'm in for 50K for the terms that you mentioned. 
So let's talk in detail. Let's go through a little bit more of uh, the numbers. Um, but uh, I, I, think, uh, I think I'm ready to commit. Fantastic. Sounds great. Thanks a lot for your yeah. confidence here. Yeah. And also, I, I, I wonder if there might be others who might be, might be interested in coming in. And um, I, I think uh, I might be able to pull together a bit of a syndicate to perhaps bring in a little bit more. Uh, with a couple more people, two or three more people after a little bit of due diligence, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and on top of that, again, and although we're not in Bangladesh, but I think um, we're always open to uh, good partnerships. On the debt side, again, the untapped business model and financing this mm -hmm. as, a, uh, as an asset, secure asset finance. Potentially, we can do a lot, much, uh, much more in terms of uh, debt financing than the equity, the small equity investment uh, that I just mentioned. So I think we're interested on both sides of that. I know, I don't know if you've already thought about or have spoken to anyone or put together any type of uh, asset financing uh, possibilities for your B2B customers, but uh, that's something that perhaps we can develop together. Yeah. With your company on tapped. Great, these are great ideas, yeah. Um, we, haven't, we haven't explored it much yet on asset financing, but obviously we see the need because it's quite unfair um, how these assets are usually financed and the, the, the uh, tenures are usually too short. Uh, so, but yeah, happy to, happy to learn more about that. The yeah. Problem, right? yep. yeah. I was thinking the same thing. There's gotta be some, you know, with, with the flows of capital and the, the, the value of the boxes, there's gotta be clever debt ways to do this royalty base, yeah. all sorts of mm -hmm. clever stuff. And, you know, I think we, uh, I've already offered this to another company and I think I'm willing to offer this to, to yours as well is potentially, um, uh, how do I say, backstopping some existing debt that you have in order to get to the right tenors. So if you're able to secure SCF three or even five year tenor uh, loan um, uh, with conditions being met, I potentially could extend that to seven years. Right. So I could sign something in advance that says I will guarantee taking on. Uh, or all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's so a good point. Yeah. Seven yeah. or eight yeah. years yeah. on that debt. Uh, we have this from the development bank of of uh, in, in in Singapore, DBS, actually on the table, especially for social oh, enterprises. And that's mean, the yeah. point so of the of content right now. The guarantees. <laughs> I'll do the earlier so. stuff, and then you know we can we can split the margin of the spread. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> can I can I come in just briefly on that, uh, Jim and uh, and Sebastian? So actually, I can talk about it very briefly, but uh, the models that I know some of the competitors or par potential partners in, uh, in Africa have used is essentially raise an SPV, a special purpose entity that issues a debt to a number of investors. Investors contribute and give them cash flow returns. And that's been how the MCOPAs and, and many, many more have used to raise a huge amount of capital, essentially to finance the... Um, the, the material, you know, the uh, containers of devices. So yeah, we, we can talk about it again as advisor or whatever if you want. And Steve, let's, let's connect on that topic very specifically because I'm doing that with a couple of different companies in Africa. And, excellent, uh, excellent. That is the core of the untapped business model throughout. Uh, oh, okay. So okay. Um, we want to do that in a, uh, primarily for um, digitally leased or digitally leashed assets. <laughs> Uh, okay. Or Sebastian, um, um, you know, pay go water, pay go refrigeration, etc. So absolutely, absolutely. Anyway, let's talk about that separately, and uh, hopefully, we can pull something together as a as a syndicate. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. I, and let me just uh, share the poll that uh, that came in from for for you, Sebastian. Thank you very much for presenting. Um, we have thank you, uh, thank you, thanks a lot for the opportunity. The results here. So, as you can see, we have um, uh, over a quarter with uh, uh, a strong endorsement uh, on the high side, or more than a quarter, a, th a third are are doing a hundred or or more, a hundred thousand or or more, and uh, quite a quite a bit all around. So, congratulations! I think you got the um, you got the audience vote here. I'll take right. up on it. <laughs>
thank you everybody who attended and um, asked questions and uh, listened patiently. Uh, thank you presenters, uh, Sebastian, Benson, and Jason for presenting. Thank you, Jim and Steve. I'm, I'm glad to see some uh, commitments yeah. come through. Um, very you. happy to see this. And to everybody else, um, we hope to see you next week. Uh, we're going to be holding this every week for the next few weeks until lockdown is over. And then after that, we'll continue, we'll be continuing with this uh, monthly uh, as the nest. So thanks once again, everybody. And if you'd Thank like you to very much. as a, um, let me share my screen. If you'd like to apply to present in the future, uh, feel free to go to findthenest.org and uh, you can submit a 30 to 60 second video presenting you and your startup and send that via WhatsApp to the number listed on that website. And we will review them and um, we will uh, invite you to the program as appropriate. Thank you very, very much, everybody. And I hope to see you next week. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye, bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much.